welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us on our weekly journey that we call Living Hope. A journey designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer. Sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how they deal with it on a daily basis. With one woman who's been on this journey longer than most, a 20-year survivor, Roberta Luna. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be back. So today we're going to do something different. We had a guest drop out at the last minute, so we thought rather than just rerun a show, let's do something different here. Let's create an educational piece about not just the journey, but the start. What is pancreatic cancer? I never heard of this till I met you, quite honestly. I never heard of the pancreas till I met you. A lot of people don't know. I didn't even know until it affects you. I don't think we even give it any thought at all, what the, even what the pancreas does. But pancreatic cancer begins when abnormal cells in the pancreas grow and then divide out of control and they form a tumor. Hmm. Tumors can either be benign or malignant. Malignant tumors are abnormal but cannot invade other parts of the body, whereas a malignant tumor grows out of control and can spread to other tissues and organs. The cancer spreads. Right. And even when the cancer spreads to other areas of the body, like into the liver or lymph nodes, it could be still called um, pancreatic cancer if that's where it started. Hmm. I, that I didn't know. I thought you, I thought it wouldn't metastasize morph into something different you'd now have breast cancer you'd now have cancer in your lymph nodes whatever that's called yeah if if it started in the pancreas it can end up in the liver the breast the lymph nodes um, other organs but it would be still classified as pancreatic cancer so let me ask you i'm going to react to a couple of these things here we're, we're, this is a show to bring out the myths and realities what it is what it's not uh, and maybe this is something people can refer back to. Maybe this is the kind of show that people start with when they're on this journey. What is the pancreas? So what is the pancreas? The pancreas is an organ. It's located in, uh, it's deep in the abdomen, more behind your stomach, and it lays more on your back and around the spine. It makes the enzymes that helps digest food and the hormones that control the blood sugar levels. So it's a very mm. important organ that we really need to have. So Why do we never talk about it? We hear about the heart, the lungs, the uh, other organs in our, the liver. I never hear anybody talk about, hey, how's your pancreas? <laughs> and you probably don't until somebody starts to have a problem with it, and then that's when most people want to know what is the pancreas, what does it do, do where is it? It's not until we start having an issue with the pancreas that we A couple question. other little organs I never hear much about, but more than I hear the pancreas, the gallbladder, until suddenly it explodes one day and you got to remove it. What the heck is the gallbladder? I'm not even sure what it is. Sort of like an extra sack, I think, that keeps something bile or something in it. I'm not, you can live without your gallbladder. Yeah, that you can live without. I mean, um, But you my, can't live without your pancreas. Well, you can actually. You become a diabetic as soon as they remove the pancreas. So you can live without it. It's just it's a very important organ. So if they have to remove it, you have to go on uh, enzymes for you know digestion. And you, a lot of people have to go on, well, if they remove the full pancreas, you have to go on insulin. You become a diabetic. So one of the questions I've heard over and over again as we've talked about this show, as I've talked to people about it is, What's the big deal? Like breast cancer, you just got to get to it early enough before it spreads, and we remove it. You remove the breast lump, and you're probably safe. You remove the lump in your lymph nodes, you're probably safe. You remove the brain tumor, it's harder, but you're probably safe. Why can't, when I discover I have pancreatic cancer, why can't I just cut this out? A lot of it depends on the location of where the tumor is in the pancreas, uh, for one. And the fact of when it was diagnosed a lot of times because the symptoms are so vague, it can lead to to the thought of other things before people even think yeah, about Yeah, so it's spread. We, we'll talk about that in a minute, the importance of getting this. But you've talked repeatedly about the first thing when they discover, decide, determine it's pancreas cancer and not something else is... Not everybody, not many of them can go through the the surgery to remove, what's it called, the Whipple surgery? Yes, the Whipple. Named after George Whipple? No, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's a doctor that invented the surgery many years ago, and it's still... Um... Mr. Whipple, from, uh, so I'm always <laughs> thinking of from Charmin tissue. No, not, not the toilet paper man. <laughs> but, all right, so th this is an operation, and he figured out how to remove... Does he remove the tumor, or does he remove the whole pancreas? It depends this? on the situation where the tumor is located. Sometimes they can remove, if it's just in the tail, they can just remove part of the tail with the tumor. 
the location is very important in the fact of if it has spread or not. Generally, if the cancer has spread to another organ, they're not generally going to do um, Yeah, because that doesn't solve the problem. Right. But again, I want to kind of zero in on this because you've had many guests, and the first thing you say, once they're diagnosed, uh, they have to determine, can you get this Whipple surgery or not? Can you get this surgery to remove it? And many couldn't. You couldn't. No, because the location, my tumor happens to be entwined with the artery and the veins that run through the, the pancreas, which many people are. So that's why one of the reasons why it would not be uh, resectable or be able to go in and remove it through surgery. But why not just remove the whole organ? Uh, I guess that's what I'm still struggling with. If I don't need it to survive, why not just cut the whole darn thing out? Even if the tumor is intertwined with this organ in a way I can't remove just the tumor, why not pull the whole thing out then? Well, like I said, you can remove the whole pancreas, and if you do, then you become a diabetic. Right. Um, then you would have to take enzymes. There are probably many reasons why that's not doable for a lot of people. Um, being not a doctor, I can't speak yeah. on that. I, I can only tell you. I've you listened know. week after. I get yeah. why the tumor itself is entangled and I can't get at it. Yeah. Um, it's too difficult to cut out. The, the arteries are running through it, and it's, it's not something I can just snip off. It's, it's wound its way. It's entangled itself in other things here. But I keep thinking, as I've heard the show, this is my, my misconception. We'll just cut the whole thing. Yeah. You can't cut your heart out because I need that. You can't cut your lungs out. But you can cut your gallbladder out because you can live without that. It may not be convenient or easy, but it sounds like you could live without it. So we, we should have somebody come out and talk about why not just why don't they just go in and cut everything out. I think one of the reasons why they probably would not remove the whole thing is that at that point it could be because it's already spread to other well, organs. Clearly, so, yeah, at that point. Um, yeah, so that would be one reason why they would not be able to remove it. So let's go back to the other problem you've talked about repeatedly. I know you've got some other things on your list, but I'm going to get a couple off of my list sure. here. And that is... People don't discover it until too late. Um, I women are taught now to um, notice as they're washing Self themselves. Self-breast exam. Yeah, whatever. Uh, men with their testicles and other sorts of things. Oh, there's a lump. I feel it. You don't feel this. There's no. I can't feel my pancreas. It's behind my stomach. It's in in my back somewhere there. I I can feel it. Something happens. Usually very uh, minor kinds of things. My back hurts. Uh, what? Give us the typical symptoms that say it might be a pancreas. Well, yeah, a lot of it is backache. Um, you know, but a lot of times, especially in somebody who's very active, like a runner or physically active, then they put it off as maybe a pulled muscle sure. or something else that's not something they're going to think about. But some other symptoms could be jaundice, which is, you know, the yellowing of the skin of the eyes, which usually happens when the bile duct is blocked. Right. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. I get those itching. things for lots of itching. Yeah, I got an itchy back. Oh, I'll bet you get a pancreatic <laughs> cancer. No, I got to put some cream on it. That's all I got to do. So the symptoms are kind of mild in the beginning. They're They're annoying, but they're not other than jaundice that's pretty serious and strange that there aren't a lot of things that cause jaundice i don't think but itching back pain i can write it off for lots of things so we ignore it we don't diagnose it correctly and now it has spread it's gotten too big it's spread to other parts of the body is that why you think this is among the more deadlier cancers nine out of ten people at this point in time will not survive after they're diagnosed? I think so because it is so hard to, you know, to find, like you say, when you're laying down and the doctor's examining you, generally they're not going to fill it unless it happens to be either extremely big or you have to be extremely small. They did mm -hmm. at the end of my mom's life be able to fill it finally um, because she'd lost so much weight mm -hmm. and the tumor had grown. But generally when you go in for the exam and they push around on your stomach, they're not going to fill it. It's usually And you're small. not going to feel it. There's no, no way you can not. do a self-exam and, and, and see... Oh, I, I notice a lump. I, you know, there's uh, other things we're all checking now, spots and, you know, for uh, skin can melanomas and stuff here and breast cancer and testicular cancer, other sorts of things. We're more and more trained to check ourselves out. Right. But this is not something probably anybody can check out. No, it's, it's not like, like you said, like you can't do a self-exam and you're not generally going to fail it. So. so there's nothing today I should be doing to determine whether I have this. Just watch the symptoms. And if you, you know, are concerned, I would, if you have any of these symptoms, really, and there's no explanation, like sudden weight loss or, again, with the, the stomach issues, there's no real reason for it, then be concerned and talk to your doctor about wanting to have your pancreas checked. And that's what you did. 
I, I did. F- I suspect that one of the reasons you are among the survivors is you didn't sit lightly when you went to the doctor and you said, ah, that's nothing. No, but it was, I think, and I don't know if it made a difference, and I, I think it probably did after losing three family members to it. I was a little bit more, I think, aware, whereas I hadn't been before. Like when my dad was diagnosed, I had no You're clue. Fearful, maybe, even I'm going to get this because we still don't know if it's uh, hereditary or not. No, and at the time I was being told it wasn't, now we know there's probably a 10 to 12 percent chance that it could be hereditary. Okay. But not knowing at that time, and after losing the three family members and having vague symptoms of my own, it became very concerned. And but you kind of insisted when the doctor kind of said, "Well, we'll look at other things. You could please look at this." First. Yeah, well, the one thing you wanted to well, one thing you wanted to rule out was being pregnant, and I knew I wasn't pregnant because <laughs> I've been pregnant and never had diarrhea with pregnancy. <laughs> I don't think that's most women have ever had that. But okay. the fact too, I don't know, never been <laughs> pregnant. I don't know what happens. But then when he said suggested, let's look at the you know, let's look at your gallbladder. I had to remind him he'd already removed it, so I know it wasn't my gallbladder. <laughs> so, uh, Doc, you want to look over here? <laughs> yeah. So it's just something being concerned and not wanting to set and wait because. We saw what my dad went through, and I know I've said before, my dad was a tall man. He weighed 175 yeah. pounds. When he died, he weighed 75 pounds, and he weighed, he looked like a Holocaust survivor. Yeah. I didn't want to put my family through that and watch that. And or have yourself them watch through that. it or anybody. All right, so is perhaps some of the education from this show and your advocacy to get it caught earlier, and that means don't dismiss anything. Don't be paranoid, but, but pay attention. Uh, what's going on in your body and maybe the medical profession should put this a little higher on their list they're putting it way down on the list it's your gallbladder it's this it's this doctor we took my gallbladder out all right well i don't know let's try something else it wasn't on top of mind it wasn't in their top 10 no it wasn't and even after telling them i've lost three family members they were looking at the fact that they didn't feel at that time it was hereditary and i was in my 40s so i was too young we don't see this until you're older like in your 70s and um so it was putting them to make them realize that not everybody fits that cookie mold where you know and if you're having these symptoms and there's no other explanation instead of waiting it took them six to eight months to diagnose diagnose my dad I think if they would have looked at that maybe sooner, maybe he would have survived longer. Maybe he wouldn't have had such a horrible experience. Yeah. Cause, um, because if you catch it earlier, what? What can I do if I catch it early? I, maybe I can cut it out. One. Yeah, if, if you catch it earlier, maybe there's possibility of surgery. Um, maybe chemo, radiation, whatever, you know. Easier to zap because it's smaller or whatever. It's yeah. more contained. Hopefully that getting in there and getting that earlier, getting the treatment will give us, you know, a longer survival rate. It's Anything I can do, we, we still, I'm still encouraging you to do some shows on alternatives. You had somebody come in and talk about some, some lots of alternatives, some of which are just flat out crazy, some of which are a waste of time, some of which might be intriguing. You yourself tried some alternatives, you've had a couple of guests hint at some things. From positive mindset to changing your diet to... Eastern medicine, I don't know, other sorts of things, uh, witch doctors waving a stick over you, whatever. Is there anything that you know of today? If you told me, God forbid, Paul, you got pancreatic cancer. We're going to try and cut it out. Oh, we can't. We're going to try and radiate it. And that may be a work. What can I do proactively? Well, I think being aware of your of your own body, you know your body better than anybody else, right. so making sure you get in there. But seeking out what is the best treatments, and if you're not really concerned or, or you don't like what the first doctor is telling you, go get a second opinion, go get a okay. third opinion, go get something until you feel that they are putting your best interest at heart and they are looking at what you want, not so much what they feel you should be doing, but what is going to help you survive um, I added uh, holistic medicine years, actually. And what after. does that mean? What is holistic medicine? For me, what it was is the... Because that can mean many things. Yeah, it can. And you have to be. I think you have to be very careful. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was going to somebody with a great reputation, you know, who's licensed, permitted. And, and what did they do? They did blood work. They did scans. They did pretty much everything that my other doctors had done. But they wanted fresh tests. They wanted them done a little bit differently and looked at them and in their holistic approach they did what one i know with vitamins one yeah. was they added vitamins supplements um the, the thing i know it sounds weird that really did help too was yoga and meditation See, i mean that's right yeah this mindset or, or this I, I remember reading years ago the late great gilda radner who died of i forgot what cancer breast cancer so i don't know which kind of cancer she died of here. i almost want to say um cervical but i better not so i'm not I, sure I, don't, I know it was a cancer and it was <laughs> yeah. a really it ugly was bad one. yeah it was bad and 
she wrote books about this and stuff. My wife was enthralled with it. Everybody liked Gilda Radner. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, she went to the University of Michigan where I went here. She, yeah. uh, I didn't know her, but uh, anyway, I felt <laughs> a certain connection there. Anyway, um, she talked about this journey that she went on trying to find and try everything. And a lot of it was mind over matter, picturing you beating the cancer, mm-hmm. creating a positive outlook, not getting negative. And so many people believe that. So many people talk about it. I don't know if there's any science behind that or if it's just anecdotal or if it's just smoke and mirrors. But you, you, if you decide you want to battle something, do you have to put yourself in the frame of mind to do battle? And what does that mean? Do you picture it? Do you do you chant? We had somebody, didn't I think they were talking about chanting. Yeah, chanting, or something. yeah. <laughs> I haven't gone that far. But, no. but you know, I, but something that... That you're, if there is some sort of, and that's certainly Eastern medicine, there's energy running through your body, your chi and stuff, you're directing this energy, you're directing your thoughts, you're directing your every, you're attacking it in your mind. Does any of that make sense? It does, and for me, I mean, I can only speak on my experience. I saw my own situation change when I did add the yoga, the meditation, the positive. I mean, I was always a positive thinker, but even more so adding the supplements and the vitamins and changing. I mean, I gave up a lot of sugar. Yeah. I gave up my favorite Dr. Pepper drink. Sugar, which was really many difficult. people think sugar feeds cancer. A lot of doctors believe that. And, you know, it's something that um, when I made all these changes, my situation changed. My last chemo was in December 2018. And I started making those changes about mid-summer. Because I think that's a common question. For those of you who are listening to this for the first time or sharing this with somebody who's just gotten diagnosed, and once you get through the shock and the denial, can't be, why me, or the anger, why me, then you you either decide one of two things. I give up, I quit, that's just the way it is, I'll I'll put my life in order and I'll do the best I can for whatever time is here. Or people like you, feisty no i'm not done yet who says i'm done yet um you seek out ways to do battle with the unknown with the unseen and part of that is putting yourself in a mental state of all right uh, you had the woman who was, an, who was a boxer yeah boy she that's all about boxing is putting yourself in. yes you're physically trained and yes you learn how to do the moves and counteract but a lot of it's mind over matter you've got to put yourself in the frame i'm going to win you've got to picture yourself winning you do, and I and I, I believe it, it's a combination of everything. You know, the mind over the matter, getting the proper treatment, getting a good support staff with your medical team, your support, your personal support people. So, could you share with us? Just walk us through. I just want to visualize what your visualizations look like. What does the doctor tell you to do? Do you see the cancer in your mind, and do you see yourself beating like an athlete? When my daughter was training to be a basketball player she didn't make it to the she made it to varsity but she didn't make it beyond the coaches would say pictures of the ball going through you get see yourself winning you know you got to believe it you can't just believe it you got to picture it in your mind i've had people say i picture the cancer i picture what it, whatever it looks like to me and i'm attacking and i'm winning and i said that what does the heck does that have to do with and i said well it's all about putting that mindset and that winning mindset. Yeah, and I think it helps. I mean, I, like the guest that we had that was the boxer, um, I could really relate to her because that's how I refer to my cancer. Whenever I talk about it, I'm in round 20. Yeah, right. So it's something that I refer to, too. I have, uh, I was given a boxing glove necklace, and, you know, so it's something that I refer I totally understood where she was coming from. And I don't know if you remember when we were growing up, they had this little thing it looked like a bozo or something but you could punch it as a punching bag and it would come back and hit back at you yeah um it stood on the ground it wasn't something that that hung it stood right. on the ground There's a so name to it. i can't think of i can't think of it either but what my visualization was that thing but it, in the shape of a pancreas hmm. and i was you know i would continue to keep Hit beating it. and keep hitting it and kept yeah. hitting it and um i know it sounds weird but it did it did help it made me feel like i was doing something and is this a daily like a mantra a visualization or just a mindset of a frame of mind that you're in that i'm i'm in battle now here or do you i'm trying to understand i've never been able to visualize things and just see myself doing something right now it's not a daily thing it's like maybe when something comes up but there for a while it was like you know every day you do the meditation or whatever it is you know that gets you through um, and and is it just calming yourself, or is it putting your mind in a different place? It's both, actually. It, it, it puts your mind in a different place, and sometimes it's very difficult to do that because you have to remove everything, any sounds coming in from the house yeah. or anything that could be disruptive. And all those little, feel, those little 
hamster wheels rolling in your head here. What if? Oh my God, that's going to be and the, the fear. I don't know that ten, I don't know that fear and anxiety makes it harder to win, but I believe it is. Fear, I think, can make it stronger. I think the anxiety can be more of a negative. Um, just because it's just something else that you have to fight. But, you know, if, if you can I mean, do fear... we make ourselves sick by being, getting ourselves... I've, I've, I've made myself sick in years ago. I get so anxious about something, my stomach's turning. Or you can get an ulcer, you know, you have a heart attack. I mean, you can really create something in your body. Bad things happen if you're just constantly tense and fearful and ang- anxious and stuff. Yeah, well, I think, like I said, the anxiety for me is bad, and there's a time when... All of us, most of us survivors are getting our scans that we have to do every so oh. often. So they call it scanxiety because yeah. you're very anxious. And a lot of times, you know, it's they plan these on a Thursday. So you're going to have to go the whole weekend before oh. you find out anything. You're so kidding me. Oh, it can geez. be difficult. But I think for me, it's the anxiety is worse than the fear. I mean, if you fear something, but you can look at that fear in the eyes or whatever you want to justify and go for it, then sometimes that can give you that extra fear fight. Fear sometimes that you motivates you or it puts you on alert it whereas does. anxiety just seems to depress you and turn you into a jellyfish yeah yeah, yeah. all right so um we talked about the pancreas how hard it is to find therefore it's and the symptoms are can easily dismissed as other things we've talked about that at length we'll keep talking about that because that's the problem why it doesn't get diagnosed quicker the doctors don't have it first in mind because this isn't statistically in terms of raw numbers, this isn't uh, as pervasive as other forms of cancer. There aren't as many people infected by this, right? No, actually, in fact, this year they estimated that 62,000 Americans are expected to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. That's like 170 a day, and out of that, only um, 11% are going to survive right. five years or greater. Whereas if you're looking like at something like breast cancer, I looked it up earlier, and it, there's like 365,000 uh, women that are diagnosed with breast cancer so they always talk more. about pancreatic cancer being rare and we don't think of it as being rare because we hear about it so much but they base it on the numbers is where the they sheer get numbers or yeah. there are there are cancers that more people get right. and therefore i think about it more often i put more dollars that's part of the problem in curing this finding an answer not enough people not enough money for the drug companies not enough doctors hear about it or see it so it's not that's how New York is advocating more money and pay more attention to this. And they're like, yeah, let's go after the bigger fish here. Let's go after heart disease. Go after well, we've we've done pretty well, actually, about getting, you know, the, the funding and going. We go every year to Advocacy Day in, in D.C. and talk to our representatives. So that is improving, but we need to improve it a great deal more. There are a lot of nonprofits out there that are doing great. I mean, you can go to PanCan's website or you can mm-hmm. go to Hirschberg's and see what they're doing as far as research. And it's really amazing how much it has changed. But we just need it, you know, faster and to come sooner. So, well, I'll listen to my list. I ate up most of the half hour here. Give me some more highlights <laughs> from your list. This is Pancreatic Cancer 101. We talk about what's the pancreas, how hard it is to diagnose, how few people think about it, so the doctor may not. May think of four other things before it may take six months for them to properly diagnose, in which case it's now grown, it's spread, and therefore it's more deadly. Um, what other misconceptions or myths or things do people need to know when they hear this? Well, I think um, one of the a big myth is that nobody survives. That's one thing that you're yeah. always told is nobody survives this, and you feel like you're getting a death sentence. Which is why you say don't go to the internet immediately because that's the message you're going to get loud and clear. You, right, you're we, done. Yeah, we try to when you know because you tell somebody not to go to the internet and research. That's the first thing they're going to do. Yeah. So we actually advise them to go to someplace like PanCan.org or Hirschberg or Let's Win. Some of the other nonprofits out there that are, have great up-to-date information that you can rely on. Don't just go Google and look at the first thing. Right. Find a reputable place to, to get your information and to contact and reach out to. I would also, you know, just be very aware of your own body. Nobody, again, like I said, nobody knows your body better than you do. So if something is happening, you need to get it checked out. If you have other family members that have been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, you need to insist that they start checking you um, sooner. Pay attention. Don't don't let it be dismissed. Don't you dismiss it in your head or have somebody else dismiss it. Okay, good advice. Anything else about uh, the pancreas or cancer in general? Here's a question that came up once a long time ago. Are all cancer cells the same? Is cancer just cancer just cancer, whether it's in the brain or the breast or the pancreas? Is it the same? I guess I don't know what it is. It's something that's gone wrong in the cell that's killing me instead of 
I really don't even understand what a cancer cell, when it turns into cancer, what does that mean? Oh, my understanding is when it turns into cancer is because, for one, you know, it's it keeps multiplying and not stopping. Mm, okay. um, I think generally maybe all, you know, cancer cells share some similarities, but with pancreatic, it's been so difficult. I think I explained before, and my uh, doctor explained it like being a hard-shelled peanut M&M to try to break through mm-hmm. that to get the, the chemo through it so that they can, you know, There's uh, an eradicate. There's protective shell of this type right. of particular cancer. And the other thing, I suspect they're not all exactly the same is because some are cancers are detectable with a blood test yeah which um and this even self-exam like um uh, prostate cancer came a long way when they developed the psa right now they can you know men can go in and get the blood test rather than the, along with the physical exam but they can start with the blood test first exactly yeah you have a higher elevated level of something whatever the psa yeah. stands for and there is for pancreatic cancer i believe it's called the ca919 what it does is it keeps track of the tumor it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. diagnose pancreatic cancer but once you're diagnosed they do this test pretty regular to see how the tumor is reacting to the treatment and if it so is So that's reacting. clearly one of the holy grails that everybody hopes for a breakthrough in a blood test of some sort like prostate where you could go in and as they run a, a panel of tests on your blood, if they ran this particular test that doesn't exist right now, right. but if they created it and ran it, it would pop up and say, hey, we see the early stages of something here. Let's mm-hmm. treat it. Let's radiate it. Let's cut it. Let's maybe change your diet so you're not feeding sugar to it and it won't mm-hmm. grow or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And there is a blood test they're working on. It's just not there yet. So hopefully, right. so, yeah, right. 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 hopefully very soon we'll get it. Yes. Okay. Um, anything else that, whew, I don't even know what to say. You had such amazing stories here. Anything else you'd like to pass on in Pancreatic Cancer 101? Any other tips, <laughs> any other thoughts, any other misconceptions? Or, or Well, again, just like I said, be aware. You're, you're the best, your best own advocate. You know your body better than anybody else. If you have any concerns, don't be afraid to speak up. And if you're not getting listened to, find another doctor. Go get a second, third opinion, whatever it takes for you to feel like you're finally being listened to. Does it help to go to groups and therapy? Does it help to handle it, to to not just get information, what are you doing, how are you dealing with it, but to not feel alone, I'm the only one fighting? It must feel very lonely. It does, and now there's a lot of support groups designated just for pancreatic cancer, which I would advise somebody to go to that mm-hmm. regular than a general. But whatever works for you, um, you can contact patient services at pancan.org. I know you'll give the number later, yeah. but <laughs> you can contact them. Um, again, like I said, Hirschberg has you know groups that you can uh, contact. So there's a lot of groups out there. You just, you know, I would suggest finding one that deals only with pancreatic cancer and not cancer in general. It makes it easier. And I'll say the other eye opener for me. I'll end with my own last thought as I've listened to this show week after week is that it's not yes it's your journey yes it's your struggle and your fight and it's your life at stake here I get all that but the circle of people it affects around you your husband, your family, your kids your friends, your work your community I don't think we take that into account enough and the impact that has it, the disruption, the the fear, the anxiety, the the fights. Do this? No, I'm not going to do that anymore. I, I've tried that anymore, and you know whatever. Or I, I, the guilt. I didn't help enough. I didn't do enough. I should have done this. I could have done this. There's a lot of that that sits under the surface. It seems to come up in these shows a lot here. It is because it, we've learned that it doesn't just affect the patient survivor. It's a family unfortunately a family disease because everybody is affected by it um yeah. rather like you say they feel at loss because there's not a lot they can do but you know um as a survivor and also as a caregiver i think being the caregiver is a much harder job between those two yeah and i really do appreciate my caregivers my husband my sons my family my friends and everybody that's been a part of this journey with me um and without having, them i don't know if i could have having been a it. caregiver for my mom to my dad my aunt not with pancreatic cancer but other deadly things everything you're always left with that did i do enough yeah well, what if what if? What if I found it sooner? What if I'd done more? I'm sorry the time I argued with him. I should have done this. I could have done this. There's a lot of that that goes on. There is, but unfortunately that's not going to change anything. So, you know, no. you just got to get over it and know that you did the best you could with what you had to work with. And just know that, again, as a, a survivor patient, I, we do appreciate our caregivers. And we couldn't get through all this without them. So. 
Well, it's a journey. And it it's is. It's a journey that many people are on. It's not a solo journey. There are other people share, that can share with you that journey. Their own experience is you're not alone. And it's probably, unless you live alone and have nobody, it's probably affecting a lot of people around you. Uh, friends, family, community, whatnot. So embrace that. It's a journey and journey with us together as we talk to more people who are on that journey. Yes. You've been on the journey for 20 years. Everybody looks at you as a trailblazer. <laughs> Way out. Oh, if only I can get to that 20 year mile marker there like Roberta did here. All right, we're going to get past that. We're going to keep going until we finally see an end and the cure for this disease or at least some, you know, uh, early detection tests, which would be really great. I, I, I'll leave you with one last thought here. Uh, I keep having one, one more. <laughs> um, my late father uh, developed leukemia later in life and told the family and we all cried and we thought this is it dad's gonna die he's got leukemia he lived for 20 years with leukemia <laughs> leukemia had gotten to a point at least his it's in different versions there's a deadlier version and there's a less deadly version of it i don't remember what the two of them are called uh his was the less deadly version it can switch you can go from one to the other without any explanation why but he was in the lower risk one and the doctor said, we understand this one now. We can treat this one now. We know, we know what to do and how to, you're not producing white blood cells, so you've got to be smart. You've got to stay away from people who are sick with colds and other things. You're, you're more likely to catch. You've got to change some of your life. You've got to change some of your diet. He stopped eating sugar and other things here. All these things that you talk about. And the doctor said something that I hope they'll say about pancreatic cancer someday. The doctor looked at my dad and he said, trust me, something else will kill you long before this does. <laughs> We know how to handle this one. Um, and, and it was that he lived with, he dealt with it successfully for his whole life for 20 years or something. Yeah. So we tend to think of cancer as a death sentence. And in more and more cancers, we're finding a way to not just stop it or to <laughs> throw it dead in its tracks here, but to deal with it and to handle it. Heart diseases and stuff. Yeah. People can live with heart diseases now for years and years and years. We've got to get to a point where the doctor says, I know this is bad and I know this is serious. But trust me, something else will get you before this does. Yeah. yeah, and we have a lot of doctors and researchers who believe that this will be a, a disease that will be manageable. something that is manageable and treated and that we will not be dying from. Before we leave, real quick, I want to yes. do two things. One is wish a happy 15th birthday to Trent Luna, who's been on our show and who lost his dad to pancreatic cancer just shortly after he was born. Right. We've had him on the show. He And he's not related to you. No, he's not. We just share the same name. <laughs> but I would be very proud of him to be a family member because he's a, a great young man. Really? He's gone to Advocacy Day with us a number of times and shared his story. He's turning 15 today mm -hmm. and a sophomore in high school, and we're just very proud of him. And I just wanted to wish him a happy birthday. And an example of how this affects people, he lost his parent never met his dad right no he never well he was a baby so he didn't know him his dad did get right. to hold him and whatnot but trent i'm sure and he's carried that. on this fight in the on the name of a father that he right. grew up without yes i know he's done an excellent job he's a very i said a, a young man i would be very proud to have as a family member as a Me son too. but i I'll, I'll claim him just because we shared the last okay. name and then also before we go yesterday august 17th was national nonprofit day i'd like to dedicate this episode to all those nonprofits that are out there working tirelessly on early detection and the ultimate goal to finding a cure so you thank go. you all right, thank you for doing what you do. Tune in action every time. Tune in more, that's what I'm trying to say. Keep coming back. Uh, too often I think it's, we think this is frightening, depressing, fearful. I don't want to hear about it. That's not the way to find your way through this journey. Uh, and if you or anybody you know needs help right now, there is a place to go. Lots of places to go. We'll give you one. Patient Services at 8772, the number PAN, uh, number two, P-A-N-C-N. I'm got me all shook up here patient service is 877 the number two p-a-n-c-a-n for the pancreatic cancer action network for the oc talk radio network i'm paul roberts thanks for joining us thanks for sharing this conversation this journey with us and i hope it brings you some help comfort relief and uh shows you a path forward uh for you or someone you know or love share this story with someone today Thanks. Come back again.